I wanted to do one more. Thank you if you're still watching. Just to go back to, I said something in, in the last film or the one before about if you can understand, so I don't have an intellectual disability, and if you can use mouth words, I'm a person who has access to speech, then people think of the consent process as being relatively simple. Like, if you wanted my consent, you would explain, I'm going to do this, is that okay? So you, you tell me what the thing is going to be and then you ask for my consent. And I hope that you've seen through what I've said so far that it's it's not that simple. There have been situations in which I've understood what you're asking and I have given an answer, but it's not it's not being representative of whether I will or want that particular thing to happen. And if I were braver, I would tell you about other situations where I've given consent, but I haven't wanted those things to happen. But I, I just leave those to your imagination. So that simplicity of consent, I think, is something that's worth troubling. And then the flip of that is that I work with people with profound intellectual disabilities and the profound nature of intellectual impairment in some cases is such that understanding a situation that is not happening now is not something that's possible. So to be able to give consent for a future event, you have to be able to conceive of time understand that something's going to happen you know string together all it's a, it's an intellectual thing to understand what might happen to you in the future and then to make a judgment about it is another intellectual thing and so there is a, a a level of profound intellectual impairment which means that you can't give informed consent in the way that we understand informed consent that permission before an event type of thing and how that's dealt with is often by just finding somebody who can give informed consent and asking them to give it on behalf of that other person, which is great because generally that person, you know, in a lovely world, that person will have somebody who understands them and cares for them and has their best interests at heart and, and reliably gives consent or withholds consent as that person would want it. But not everybody has that person. I have a friend who um, I have to have a pause because it they they occupy a tricky legal space and so I mustn't give you any detail about them at all and I was just thinking if I even refer to their gender is that too much but I have a friend who has legally no family and um, lives in different places at different times um, and doesn't have anybody who particularly understands them well. I mean, I'm, I've known them for maybe 10 years now. Uh, I've met them at various... Like, I don't know them very well, but I'm probably somebody who's had one of the longest relationships with them, and I don't know what's in their best interest. They, they don't have somebody. So it's important that we look for ways of understanding consent with people who don't use mouth words and with people who don't have intellectual capacity. And there is a thing called process ascent that was, um, it came from dementia work originally. And what you are asked to do is to recognize in the moment whether somebody is willing to, to be a part of the activity that's happening. And if you have somebody who's, got good expressive communication you know somebody who can vocalize somebody who can walk away that's quite easy to do like it's very clear if somebody gets up and moves away from the table that they don't want to be at the table like it's not there's this idea that if you can't talk then we can't get consent it's, it's very simple like no she doesn't want to be here because she left 
understand. It's very easy to understand in those sorts of situations. But there are more complicated, and so process ascent happens in the moment, every moment. You can't get it ahead of time because it's for people who don't have the intellectual capacity to understand time and to predict future. You have to get it continuously. Is this okay in this moment? Is this okay in this moment? And if you are conducting yourself ethically in those situations, then there is a responsibility on you as the person who is facilitating whatever the activity is to constantly be asking, is this okay? Is this okay? Is this okay? Do they consent? Are they, do they assent? Do they assent? Um, and like I say, if there's somebody who has bold communicative strategies, it's a very doable thing. And actually there are situations in which the person who is the primary carer or the person who is the position of responsibility might give consent when the person who is the, you know, the person who's being in the situation might object. So, um, like, your your mum might say that you should take part in this drama activity because she knows it's going to be enriching for your life, but you get to the drama activity and you walk off because you don't want to be a part of the thing with the drums. Yeah, who's, who's one do we respect then? Is it your mum because she knows best or is it you because it's you having the experience? Even with clear communication, like being able to walk off or being able to make a distress noise, there's still it's still never a simple thing. But there are people for whom they're not able to use math words, they're not able to intellectually understand the future, and also they don't have access to bold forms of communication like walking off or making sound. So if you're somebody who's got limited mobility, no access to vocalizations you know little facial movement how do we seek consent from you and process assent is something that we can still look to use but only if the person seeking that assent attunes themselves to that other person and it it very quickly sounds like you're talking about vibes and auras and things like this but attunement is a very practical thing it involves paying attention to the other person and bringing your awareness towards the other person and being in touch with how you feel in response to the other person and and how those feelings shift and what's happening is that our bodies sync up in multiple ways. You know, like if you walk down the street with someone, you naturally fall into step with them. Our bodies naturally sync up with the bodies around us. So if you can pay attention to and focus on and attend to somebody else, even if they are a very passive in their body, you get that kind of sync up between bodies happening. And then what we might describe as I just had a gut instinct or I just had a feeling isn't just a kind of oh I got a vibe you know it's not a it's not a hippie nonsense thing it's a tangible reality you feel in your system the effect of their system changing because you're walking in sync so when they slow down you feel that slowing in your system so if you attune to your person then you can get a readout on or you can try to approach a readout on whether they are willing to do the activity that is taking place or not willing to do the activity that is taking place. And if we are acting ethically, that is a really tricky and difficult thing to do and you would never be certain about it. But you should be trying. We should always be looking for consent at every level of ability, at every level of intellectual capacity all across neurodivergence and we should never assume that because you can give a yes or no it's a simple thing and we should never assume that if you can't give a yes or no that you can't give consent because it's about it's about how we listen to these things and how we understand them and it's worth thinking about them in relation to autism
in relation to intellectual disability and in relation to all of the other intersectional things that could make you especially vulnerable. <laughs>